Hi, I'm Dr. Kyle Stanley, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how to decrease the amount of bone loss that you may be having on the implants that you're placing or restoring. So let's first look at bone and tissue. I think this is a much discussed topic. Going back to 1996, when we actually knew in 1996 that we needed a certain minimum tissue thickness above our implants in order to protect osteointegration. But of course, none of us read research and none of us listened to this. It took until Thomas Linkovicius in 2015 published this really breakthrough study because it was the first one done on humans where we looked at the difference in tissue thickness. So on the left side, you see thin tissue patients lost a little over a millimeter over the first year and thick tissue patients lost about 0.2. So, you know, is this statistically different, uh, significantly different? Yes, it is. Is it clinically different? Well, let me ask you that. If it's your mouth or if it's your daughter's mouth or your son's mouth or your husband or your wife's, which one do you want? I want the 0.2, that's for sure. And the only difference in these patients was that the, the, the thin tissue patients had less than two millimeters of tissue thickness and the thick tissue patients had more than two millimeters of tissue thickness. So kind of an interesting study. And then uh, the next study that Lincoln Vicious did was in 2018. And the question he had was, okay, we know two millimeters is, greater, is better than less than two millimeters. But how about 2 versus 2.5 or 2.5 versus 3? And so he looked at these three different thin, medium, and thick tissue biotypes. And what he found was that there was less bone loss on the patients that had 3 millimeters or greater tissue thickness. So we started back in 1996 knowing that 2 was better, greater than 2 is better than less than 2. And then 2015, now on humans, greater than two is better than less than two. And now here we are, we know that three is better than even 2.5 or two. Also, when you look at some other studies where they place implants and then they check the mucosal thickness after the implant has, has integrated and has been in function for a little bit, what they find both in dogs and in humans is that we have more than three millimeters of tissue thickness. So 3.6, 3.9. And this is where we start to get to the idea of what is our minimum, what is our ideal, and what is our maximum. And so really four millimeters is what we're using with our team as our ideal vertical tissue thickness above our implants. Let's talk about our next topic, one abutment, one time. Well, we know the research is there, right? When you look at this, seven controlled clinical studies, abutment disconnection and reconnection significantly affected peri-implant marginal bone levels. Also another one, randomized multi-center three-year follow-up. The one abutment one-time group exhibited significantly less bone loss. The problem was we never had the components that helped us do this. So, you know, me and Sasha Jovanovic were doing a lot of these cases earlier. Um, you know, I, I used to see Nyaki Gambarina talk about this. Wow, that's amazing. We were doing it with guided surgery. So we could plan the final abutment before we place the implant. The difficulty with this was if the gingiva moved, then I had to prep in the mouth or I had to take it out anyways. And then also, as we know from Dr. Wadwani and from Linka Vicious, we had to use cement and cement can be a big problem with implant crowns. So we knew that biologically it made sense, but really functionally and just every day, it didn't make sense. And it really took implant companies to change some of the componentry for us to make it easier. So an example here is the MIS Connect. And this study is also from the Gavicious from 2021. What you see on A and B is using the connect abutment. So this is a stay in um, one time, one abutment type of restoration where as the implant is placed or uncovered, this abutment goes in, changes it to tissue level, and then everything is done on top of that. So we're never going back down to bone level. On the right side with C and D, 
you see a traditional healing abutment with a tie base workflow. Now again, when you look at C and D, you look at the bone and you say, that's pretty good, right? Bone all the way up to the implant neck. However, if this is your mouth or your family's mouth, I want B. I want bone above the implant neck. And the only difference in this study was that connect abutment that was being used. And so this was the type of innovation that we needed in order to do what we knew was biologically sound, but also that was functional. <clears throat> so when you look here, you have the connect abutment going in and everything else will be on top of that. So there's multiple different heights that you can, that you can use with this stay in abutment. And you can also do screw retained on top of it. So once you put that stay in abutment, everything is done on top of that level. So we never have to go back down to bone level. We never have to rip those hemides that hemides hemidesmosomal attachments that we get to a clean biocompatible abutment. So we're doing, you know, in this case, you can see a cover screw, temporary titanium abutment. You can see a scan body and even a tie base for a final restoration. So let me show you a case where we use this. This is a retained primary tooth. Why we were taken out was uh, aesthetics. The patient had pain on it now, and we also had super eruption of the upper tooth. So taking all that into account, we decided that now was the time to extract this, this baby tooth and go on with treatment planning. So we're gonna do it with guided surgery. We're gonna do it with this open lattice type of guide from, uh, from the M-Guide Center. And I like these type of guides because it allows me to pick the amount of undercuts that I want. So that's one less hand that needs to hold the guide. Meaning that could be my hand or my assistant's hand, but he or she can then retract or suction or, you know, uh, added water if they need to. So having one extra hand is is fairly good in surgery. I can also see everything really well, right? I can see the other teeth. Speaking of irrigation, I can get better irrigation down into the area because it's not fully covered by a guide. Now, because we are doing this fully guided surgery, we attempted to pre-plan the provisional and we're going to do it on top of that connect abutment. So here we have a screw retained provisional that's going on top of that stay in abutment. And we, uh, Thomas Lingabicious and I attempted to do this in front of a group of uh, people taking our zero bone loss course. So here we are with the printed guide, prefabricated temporary titanium abutment with a milled PMA provisional. I extracted the tooth. You can see we have some, uh, uh, bone there, right? Before we even started placing the osteotomy because those baby teeth roots, there wasn't much there. So it wasn't like a traditional immediate. I did my osteotomy. I placed my, my uh, V3 implant here. And so here is traditional implant placement, right? At bone level, or here we're a little subcrustal, as you can see in this radiograph. Now, this is where the workflow changes. So here I put in the stay in abutment and because my implant had good stability, I was able to torque this down to the 30 Newton centimeters that you see. Now, the goal is that I will never remove that. So I've transitioned this to kind of a tissue level implant, but I still have all the surgical flexibility of bone level and the restorative flexibility of bone level. So at this point, we attempted to place the scan body and we were going to try to do this in two appointments where we, we place the implant and the next appointment, a few months later, we place the final restoration. So here's our provisional. Uh, the contacts were good. I did have to adjust the occlusion a little bit. Occlusion was a little off. So maybe if that was my scan or in the printing of you know some type of... of uh, micro motion or some type of milling, shrinking and swelling, something happened here. So a little bit of adjustment, but interproximal was good. Now, I wish I had done a little tissue grafting a la Neki Gumbarena around the, the collar here. I didn't, and maybe I should have. 
So this is how the patient left. Immediate implant place with that stay in abutment and on top of that, a screw retained provisional. We come back a few months later and we place the final restoration. So you see I have a tie base that goes inside that stay in abutment. I have the polished zirconia abutment. And on top of that, in this case, we use lithium disilicate, which we tend to use on top of our implant crowns. So this is what it looked like. And you can see we have fairly good bone, even after two years, above the implant neck. So I was fairly happy with this. But what I was most happy about was actually the tissue. When you look at the tissue here, look at how on the left side, it, it doesn't look fantastic. And on the right side, you see like this band of what looks like keratinized attached tissue. Now, how did we do that? Well, one reason may be because we didn't take it in and out a bunch of times, right? Take it out to do an impression, put it back in, take it out to do, to put in the final, maybe there's an adjustment, you know, other provisionals. We did it one time. But what I think may be uh, even more important, especially for the tissue in this case, is the material selection. So we know, and I love how Eric Rompin says this, you can have two things. You can have an epithelial attachment or you can have a pocket. That's it, right? So if you have a biocompatible clean abutment, you will have an epithelial attachment. And so this is how we plan our implant restorations, you know, single units at least, with our team. We always have a titanium base. And why that is, is we know now that, well, zirconia abutments can sometimes fracture. And the other reason is that zirconia abutments, what we've seen is they can actually reshape the inside of our hex. And then we can have bacterial infiltration and then we blame it on, you know, uh, periaplantitis, for example, and maybe it was something that we did. So you have that zirconium oxide abutment. On top of that, you can use uh, porcelain, you can use lithium disilicate, you can do full contour zirconia. But notice how our tissue follows that tissue level, okay? We want to expose as much polished zirconia as we can. So let's talk about polished zirconia. Why is it polished? You look here, this is how it came out of our milling machine on the left side. And in this case, we did a five-step polish. We know from research you really only need a two or three-step polish to get the good epithelial attachment, but we're a little crazy. Look at the difference, right? Big difference here. Now you can say, okay, it looks nicer, but what's the biological reason for it? Well, lower adhesion of bacteria, less inflammatory response in the tissues, increased aesthetics, decreased probing depths, less plaque accumulation, less bleeding on probing. Pretty significant. When you look at this study too, we see that fibroblasts exhibited significantly higher proliferation rates on zirconia compared to titanium. We think about titanium as this like amazing material, which of course it is, but actually the tissue likes the polished zirconia better. Cell spreading was generally higher on all polished surfaces in relation to non-polished. And the fibroblast and ep epithelial cell response is influenced by both the material and the surface topography. So you have to think, what material am I going to have in this transmucosal region? And I want to try to expose the most zirconium oxide as I can. So this goes back to what we're talking about with our stain abutment. You want the stain abutment to transition it from subcrestal or epicrestal to supracrestal. But you also want to you also want to balance that with exposing as much polished zirconium as possible for the tissue. So Everything with dentistry is always a balance, and it's the same way here. And I think if we do this, that's how we're going to get this type of tissue response. It's not the traditional implant tissue that you see that is flabby and loose and red. It's tight and it's pink, and you blow air on it and nothing moves. And I think that will help us reduce the bone loss on our restorations. So I know today was quick, but I talked about tissue thickness, how to think about this when we're placing our implants. Disconnections, maybe using one abutment one time. Now that we do have 
implant companies that have have given us the opportunity to really have one abutment one time with surgical and restorative flexibility. And lastly, material selection. I think if we understand our materials and know that implants are not teeth, they're a medical device, and it's different than teeth. We have to think differently about implants and teeth. If you understand the material selection, that's one other thing that can help you in preventing bone loss. So thanks for watching. And if you need to contact me and go to my Instagram and take a picture of this, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. So thank you, Seattle Sun Club.